these guys are the cream of the country. We trust them to do a job. We hire them and trust them to do a job for us. And what do they do? They rob us. Something should be done, something has to be done, I think, to assure the public about the legal profession because what has happened over the last number of years has done, to my mind, irreparable damage. It's the law of the jungle. They've been in a very privileged position for a century or two centuries. We cannot get justice. Where is the justice in all of this? Nobody seems to be able to help us. We've gone through the law society. They're not doing anything. They don't seem to be willing or able to be able to help us. When you hire a solicitor, you expect them to fight your corner. But what happens when your lawyer ends up fighting with you? Tonight, Primetime investigates the disputes that arise between solicitors and their clients over unnecessary delays, poor work and overcharging. We examine how complaints against these solicitors are dealt with and count the true cost of challenging your solicitor. There are over 7,000 solicitors in this country. They carry huge responsibility and have a vital role at key moments in our lives, when we have an accident, buy a house and when we die. Solicitor Cormac O'Callagh is the third generation of his family in the profession. His business is based on reputation and trust. He's concerned about the profession's image. I think the perception out there in the public is that solicitors perhaps cannot be trusted. And I think that's unfortunate because perhaps a minority of solicitors have perhaps got into difficulties or have maybe let their clients down and that has led to a perception out there that solicitors cannot be trusted or they're no longer honourable. The largest number of complaints against solicitors is about delays and not communicating with clients. In a recent survey of solicitors' opinions, they cited a too heavy workload as their biggest problem. A solicitor's delay in administering a will can cause stress and worry to grieving relatives. Nine years ago in 1997, Mary Gallagher, who owned this house and land in Killala, County Mayo, died. She left the house to her cousin, Teresa Toulon, and made her executress of her will, which meant she had to oversee the solicitor's administration of it. That solicitor was Adrian Burke from Ballina, whose responsibility it was to ensure that everyone got the money and land they were owed. But things did not go as planned. Unless we rang him or wrote him a letter or reminded him of the long delays, there was no response. We have been waiting for that letter or that phone call that never came. She remembers all the letters she wrote seeking action from Adrian Burke and all the false promises she was given along the way. In March, um, March the 2nd, I am now in a position to deal with various matters on the estate, including the closing of accounts and the rectification of the lands. That was March the 2nd, 1999. He was ready to do it then. In, other, in June 2003, he said we'd be hearing from him within a month. He'd have everything done, including the payment of taxes, in one month. But worse was to come. Four years after Theresa had paid her inheritance tax to her solicitor, she discovered it had not been sent to revenue, exposing her to penalties. I, I really couldn't believe it, that he hadn't paid in the money that we had we given to him. Revenue then wrote to us, uh, they were writing to Adrian Burke for 12 months mm -hmm. and they never got an answer from him. We were seeing another side of Adrian Burke that we hadn't anticipated. It was even getting worse at this stage. Adrian Burke admitted his mistake and apologised, but he didn't pay the penalties until last year. Theresa's other problems were far from over. Six years after Mary's death, the main beneficiaries of her will still hadn't been paid. Teresa did battle to get her inheritance. He only gave us the money because we went into his office. The, all the others weren't on their knees at his door. That's why, how we got it. You had to beg for everything. Be on your knees at his door before you got any attention or any justice, really. Her main concern was her elderly brother, John Burke, a small local farmer who hadn't got his money or his land. The minute he heard he was getting this money, he said he'd buy a tractor. 
said, I'll be able to buy a tractor now. That was in 2003. When the delay was in its seventh year, the situation became urgent. John began desperately writing to the solicitor. At this stage, my brother was in hospital, seriously ill, in hospital. Adrian Burke then wrote, asking John to sign tax forms so he could pay him, forms which should have been dealt with a long time before that. Teresa brought them to his bedside. We brought the letters into him and he was very ill. And he just looked at this letter and it made him physically ill. He was physically ill in the hospital. He said, take that away from me. The solicitor, Adrian Burke, had attempted to get the money to John, but things had moved too slowly. He died in November, last November, 2005, without ever having the benefit, yet the satisfaction of getting his money. That's what we have to bear. It's so awful. It's horrific. Nobody should have been able to put up with it. My health is deteriorated. We can't cope with it anymore. John's money was only paid into his estate after this program wrote to Adrian Burke one month ago. Adrian Burke is a respected member of the legal profession and an ex-president of the Law Society in the 1990s. He declined to give a statement to Primetime, but has blamed his delay on the departure of two of his staff who were across the file and his own recent health problems. But it doesn't satisfactorily explain the failure to pay John Burke and the nine-year delay over the will. I'd have done a better job myself, and I'd have it finished long ago if I took it on myself. And uh, all the money he charged us to do it, and he took that money out years ago, and he still hasn't the work done. He should have done all this for us. We shouldn't have to do anything but the stress of it all, having to get through all this work, writing letters, and hoping, hoping, waiting every day, maybe there's a letter today. We don't know when we'll have closure on this now, how long more it's going to go on. We have no idea. Solicitor delays are a recognised problem in the legal system. A recent government report has recommended more cost penalties for delays in litigation. Solicitor delays can even threaten the roof over your head. Irish woman Annette Strachan moved from England with her family to start a new life in Prospect West, County Tipperary, ten years ago. She hired a solicitor to register the land into her name that her father had given her. Then she built a house on the land with financial assistance from the local authority in 1998. But there was a hitch. To continue her loan arrangement with the local authority, they needed Annette's title deeds proving that she owned the land. So she contacted her solicitor from Limerick City, Joseph Griffin, but he failed to respond. We went to, went to his office um, umpteen times. I have phone records where I phoned him 42 times in one year. Um, I know his number off by heart. Um, and he would give no reason why the land was not registered. Years went by and Annette despaired of the situation. The level of frustration is huge because you are totally out of control. You have no power. The solicitor is the one that has the power. The solicitor maintained he couldn't register the land because of a boundary issue, but Annette knew it had been resolved in 1999. Then, in 2003, Tipperary Local Authority issued a court summons, seeking Annette and her family's eviction. They were going to take me to court. They would phone me up and say, you still haven't got this sorted out. You cannot continue like this, you know, you are going to lose your home. Well, to receive a phone call like that, on your own, with three kids, I'd be in tears when I came off the phone and the children would be, you know, Mum, you know, what's wrong? And I didn't want to say to them, look, you know, we're going to get thrown out of our house. So I'd say, oh, we might have to move house, love. With the prospect of losing her home, Annette tried her solicitor relentlessly, but with no effect. It was all very well for the solicitor. He said he was bringing up a young family, and, but he could go to bed at night and forget about me. 
I couldn't forget about him because I was under threat of losing my home. On the court steps, Tipperary local authority offered to sell her the house for €70,000. Annette came up with the money by taking out two costly personal loans. But she still needed her deeds. Two months ago, she finally brought Joseph Griffin to the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal. They asked him why he didn't do it and he said, I can't explain. I have no answer. And that was, that was basically it. He couldn't explain why he hadn't done it. The tribunal found Joseph Griffin guilty of professional misconduct for a seven-year delay. But the tribunal couldn't compensate Annette for her financial loss. I should have paid back a total of 41000 on the house. Um, I've now got personal loans totaling over 70000 So, And the interest, obviously, on top of that. So the implication to me is, is huge. And I wouldn't have had this problem. I would have been paying off week by week if I'd been allowed to. I wouldn't have a massive loan hanging over my head. To get compensation, Annette will now have to try to bring a case against her solicitor, but nothing can compensate her for the toll it took on herself and her family. It was heartbreaking. I don't think they realise how much it affects somebody's life. It caused a rift between myself and my husband. Um, it caused worry to my kids. It certainly caused worry to me. And it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Joseph Griffin told Primetime that he regrets the handling of this case. It's out of control from the consumer's point of view. As I say, I, I'm paying, and the service is there for my convenience, but I don't have control over it. And that's the way it should be in every other business. Most people don't know enough to assess the standards of the legal service they get. But sometimes the consequences of a poor service are so bad it's impossible to ignore. It was here in Glengariff County, Cork, and in this house that Bill and Jackie Bullen planned a peaceful retirement eight years ago. But it would all go terribly wrong. This is a new me. This is not the guy who came here. You know, I'm not ashamed to cry anymore, you know. Bill, originally from Dublin, and his wife Jackie, remember what they were told when they were buying the house. When we came here originally, this is what we thought was part of our property, together with the whole of this house here in front of us. There was a sign in the garden. A sign in the garden, Cottage yeah. for sale. The view we thought was our little piece of heaven. We thought, yeah, this would do us. We could do our gardening, which we like, and, and, and just be very, very happy. Um, we believed that, that we, we owned this, this, up there, all of the drive down here. Although they had concerns about buying a property with an unmarked boundary, their surveyor and their solicitor, Florence Murphy, of O'Dunvan Murphy Solicitors, said there was no problem. Shortly after the sale, they found out that the property boundary, in fact, cut through their house, which meant somebody else owned part of their home. It cut it through the dining through room. The, the, this is the dining room. It cut through here in a V-shape. Um, cut through the kitchen. The kitchen, which is here. So, in fact, we are trespassing in part of our kitchen and in part of our dining room, and have been for eight years. Their contract of sale clearly stated they were buying a house, not part of one. Had we had known we wasn't buying, I mean, we wouldn't have bought. You know, who buys only part of a house with no entrance? You know, I mean, you don't do that knowingly, do you? When they discovered that their property was worthless, the Bullens contacted their solicitors. They say the only course of action discussed was doing a land swap with the owner of part of their home. They would get all the land in which their home stood and in return pay the landowner and give him some land on the opposite side of the house. We, sh we shouldn't have had to have made, done a deal to get that. We'd had a, a, a surveyor um, 
and was assured that everything was all right. The Bullens resented the deal and over the years, rows broke out with their neighbours over the amount of land they had given away. Unhappy also with their solicitor, they got a new one. But it was then that they discovered that their problems were bigger than ever. In the deal that was meant to fix the problem, there was an error. The new solicitor found that in the land transfer documents drawn up by O'Donovan Murphy, the Bullens had given away almost 25 times more land than they'd agreed to. It was only um, when we got the file in 2003 that we see about the maps and these documents. We, we hadn't seen them. We'd only been given a top copy. The new solicitor said it was four years since the deal was done and there was nothing he could do. Um, he said that he, he um, that we were 100% in, in the right, that right was on our side. Um, but he didn't do anything about it. We stayed with him for 20 months. That solicitor said that now he could put a face to Florence Murphy, he couldn't go against him in court. Left without a solicitor, they tried the political route. But as luck would have it in a small town, their local TD was Dennis O'Donovan, the O'Donovan in the O'Donovan Murphy name, but not practising at the firm. We approached him wearing his other hat and he said to leave it with him. We then received a letter from, from him to say that um, being as he's so closely connected with the firm, he felt that he couldn't help us. They spent years trying to get a solicitor who would help them and had to leave the county to try and get one. We, we went to the Law Society and asked for a list of solicitors who would go against another solicitor. And we came up with a lovely solicitor from Clonmel who was very nice. And at first he, he, he said that, yes, he would take us on. Um, and then we have a letter from him to say after that his workload was so, so big that he could no longer do it for us. Two years ago, things took a turn for the worse. A summons arrived from O'Donovan Murphy to say that um, the landowner and the uh, people that had purchased the house at the back of it was, was suing us. Devastated, they were being sued for not honouring the land swap agreement. The Bullens were in shock that O'Donovan Murphy were now acting against them. We were told uh, that it was a conflict of interest, that, you know, that they could, you know, uh, being as they were our old solicitors, that they could um, represent the people that were, that, that were suing us. The Bullens eventually got a solicitor to defend them, and the case was settled last October. Although the purpose of the settlement was to resolve the land issues, inserted into it was a clause concluding all rights of action against O'Donovan Murphy, who agreed to pay €20,000 to the Bullens. Even if they could prove they had grounds for action, the Bullens knew that it wouldn't be easy to get a solicitor to take on another. We found that solicitors would take you so far, but they wouldn't take you all the way. You will not anywhere get a, one solicitor to sue another solicitor. You won't. Before this happened, I wouldn't take an aspirin or an aspirin or anything like that. I'm now on prison for uh, attacks. Um, panic attacks. Panic attacks. This is a new me. This is all part of the person I am now. Just to ordinary people, we came here, bought the house in good faith. That's all. We, we were retired, we just wanted a quiet life. And it's turned into a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, no one. O'Donovan Murphy gave a statement to Primetime. They say they do not accept that the Bullens have reasonable grounds for dissatisfaction. They also say it would be improper for them to comment while the settlement awaits full implementation. Getting one solicitor to sue another is a general problem. Even Cormac O'Callagh is prepared to admit he's reluctant to take action against a colleague. I, I think I'd have difficulties with that. Why? I just would have difficulties with it. Just, I would have difficulties taking a case against a colleague. 
but you know, think there will, will be circumstances which arise where it's well, necessary. Well, absolutely. Well, perhaps in extreme cases where it was a very, if, if the, the claim was very valid, and I have no doubt claims which are valid would be dealt with appropriately, um, I'd certainly be open to looking at it. But I suppose as a general principle, you'd prefer not to go against a colleague. If it's a colleague in the same street as you or in close proximity that you work with on a very regular basis, it may tarnish or undermine your relationship with them. Perhaps if it was a colleague in different parts of the country who had no dealings with, you might look at it in a different light. But even in extreme negligence cases, finding a new solicitor can be difficult. Terence Storen and his wife Maureen are veterans of the legal battlefield. They sued both their own solicitor and the solicitor who sold them a defective property. They won a landmark negligence case in the Supreme Court in the 1990s, but it took them eight years to do it. Like others, they tried over 20 solicitors on the Law Society's list of so-called willing solicitors before they found someone to take their case. I think in terms of people who have complaints against solicitors, from the telephone calls and correspondence that I've had, I don't think anything has changed. If anything, considering we're 15 years on, uh, the profile that, profile that our case had, um, one would have thought that steps would have been taken by the Law Society and the League profession in particular to, to set up some sort of system to help people in our situation. Disputes with solicitors commonly rise over the bill. Bills are often thought to be not just high, but impossible to understand or even challenge. Tig Foley is a lecturer in English at NUI Galway. He queried his solicitor's fee of 11,500 for his legal separation. It was a bad time. I, you know, I'd been going through a marital separation after 16 years of marriage. Um, then then I, I got this huge bill. I was in shock, in fact, you know, when I received the bill. I had no notion that the fees were going to be so high. Although the bill was a very average one, one reason Tighe was so put out was because the solicitor never gave him a fee estimate at the start, as she was obliged to do under Section 68 of the Solicitors Act. And Section 68 is a price tag on legal services. Uh, I hadn't got a Section 68 letter. I had no indication of what the amount would be. Having failed to get an estimate, when his bill arrived, it was presented in a way he couldn't understand. Uh, it told me that, you know, it cost 15 cents to do a photocopy. But then I realised that the, the amount that constituted almost the entire bill uh, was hidden under something called instruction fee. Um, and uh, as I discovered, uh, you have no legal entitlement to find out how the instruction fee is arrived at. The instruction fee, in Tighe's case €11,500, is what solicitors charge for their professional advice and work. It's not itemised, and even people whose job it is to assess legal bills say it's far too vague. A client is entitled to an itemised bill, in other words, setting out each item of work done. In that bill, there will be what is known as an instructions fee. It is the type of fee that the person getting the bill will not understand and cannot understand. And this creates a great problem. So what can you do if you want to query your legal bill? You can have it independently assessed under a system known as taxation. However, taxation applies the cost standards lawyers set for themselves and of which most people are unaware. The government and even the legal profession admit it needs change. I do think the system of taxation is pretty much discredited. Um, at the heart of the problem is uh, the fact that uh, members of the legal profession are appointed, solicitors normally, are appointed uh, to this vital role uh, which sets the standards effectively for fees across the whole of the legal profession. Getting your bill checked through taxation may seem worth it, since most bills are cut 20% in the process. However, legal professionals know this and factor it in. Everybody knows that uh, the fees are always reduced, and everybody also knows that fees are reduced 
uh, by a proportion of the f of the fee that's originally proposed. So the higher the fee solicitors and barristers put in as their starting point, the more they're going to get in the end. So the system appears to invite the exaggeration of bills, but few people get their bills checked by taxation because it's a gamble. If your bill isn't reduced by a significant amount, you pay more in government charges. But the gamble can be worth taking because the savings can be huge. Here are some examples of savings made when bills were independently assessed. In a family law case, the instruction fee claimed was 320,000. This was cut to 255,000 by the taxing master, a saving for the man paying the bill of 65,000 euro or 20%, an average cut. In another case where the state was paying the bill, the instruction fee was reduced from 2.25 million to 765,000, a saving of nearly 1.5 million euro. And in a tribunal's fees case, again where the state was paying the bill, the taxing master saved the state nearly 5 million euro. So how high are solicitors' fees generally? A recent survey showed that solicitors' fees increase at twice the rate of ordinary workers' wages. We also compare badly with England in personal injuries cases. We are more than four times more expensive. Afternoon, Judge. This is regarding case and high fees in family law cases have attracted the attention of judges. The Supreme Court judge, Mr Justice Hardiman, said in a recent case he'd heard an estimate of one side's costs, which caused him surprise and disquiet. And, he said, the cost figures in family law cases are sometimes very high, out of proportion to what is involved. Given all of this, a system of high fees where bills are hard to understand and difficult to challenge, should we be surprised that overcharging has become a scandal? Whether anybody had taken 5,000 or 15,000, it was still overcharging, and he was found to have overcharged me. New Clever White, day and night. Wax for instant whitening throughout the day, and gel for nighttime whitening that works while you sleep. Clever White, all day, all night, all white. <laughs> Now there's an exciting new family saloon from Chevrolet and it grabs attention right from the start. The spacious new Chevrolet Aveo four-door family saloon. Yours for an unbelievable €14,745. The new Chevrolet Aveo, turning heads at your local dealer now. Chevrolet, born strong. Cellulite appears when the skin's supporting fibres lose elasticity and begin to pull inward. Lipocure from Vichy works by relaxing these fibres, and it's proven to reduce the appearance of dimpling without massage in just two weeks. Vichy. Health is vital. Start with your skin. This is Ron Seal One Coat Tile Paint. You know what it does. Ron Seal. It does exactly what it says on the tin. This morning, John is withdrawing your money from his account. Today, Teresa is buying her groceries with your money. Insurance fraud is a crime that you pay for in your premium. Protect yourself. Report suspect claims. Don't let them take their holiday at your expense. Insurance fraud is a crime. No exaggeration. My fame, my fortune, where'd it come from? <laughs> I'll tell you. These two guys here, a building too high, a hole too deep, worked hard, played hard too, didn't take no lip. But these kids today, I mean, look at Kevin here. He's just over from the old country. What's he do? Barely lifts a finger and he's up 25 grand. And there's 250 grand on a game show and 42 swanky trips for two to the city. Yeah, those old cocky heading out with some big shot named Marty. You don't know how easy they got it. Marty, I mean Marty who? Look, Senator. Gentlemen, you have done George Washington proud. The governor's going to be giving you all a pardon. Show's not a thing without me. 
Excuse me, Senator? I have an idea. My, my. I'm the king of the South Shore. You made a thing without me. You'll see. A show ain't a thing without me. About once, about twice. Everything I do, I win. Now Excuse me, Senator. I have another idea. A show not a thing without me. Your blue eyes. Your lips. Your cheek, you think that's more cheek than bone. Your tummy. Your fingers, yes, they're long. Your smile, your mother says you got from dad. Your feet, you definitely got from dad. Your other half, the better half, your flesh and blood. We're ready to take care of all of you. We're Boopa Ireland. So, the pizza restaurant, how's it going? Business is um, very good. Is it? But look, Goodfellas Solos. Uh-oh. I have to buy some milk powder. Off you go, then. I'll have one of these. I thought you were getting yeah, yeah. some milk powder. Tomorrow I'm seeing my bank manager. Did you make the appointment? Oh, he did. That's what I thought. Give them back to the lady. Oh, look, you're not going to... Oh, you are. You're being illegal. They're going to arrest him. Formal complaints about solicitors overcharging are relatively common, but it became a national scandal when abuse survivors were overcharged on being compensated for childhood suffering in industrial schools. Jack Dooley and his daughter Jennifer live in County Kilkenny. In his 70s now, Jack still vividly remembers the physical abuse he suffered in industrial schools. The beatings we took were unbelievable. They sprayed us across the beds and they let her live in daylights out of us. If we screamed, they laid into us more. If we didn't scream out, they laid into us more to make us scream. Jack came here to the Residential Institutions Redress Board to be compensated by the government for his suffering. He was made an award, but the full amount wasn't handed over to him. At the redress board, my barrister told me the amount of money which had been awarded to me was for myself. No other deductions, nothing. Now, the barrister had left and I went in to see my solicitor and he told me there was a shortfall. I asked him what did he mean by a shortfall. He said there were certain monies to be paid to him. Abuse survivor groups like Right of Place argue that because the redress board paid solicitors' costs so generously, survivors should not have been billed. The Act is quite clear what you call it, that they were going to be paid for all the expenses of court. This was all dealt with before the, 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 the redress board even sat in 2002. They knew what they were getting and they were being paid handsomely for what they were doing, up to 16,000 in some, in some cases, which is a, a hell of a lot of money. You weren't, you weren't by your solicitor. When Jack spoke out on the Joe Duffy show, his solicitor Tim Kiley of Poe Kiley Hogan in Kilkenny wrote to him denying double charging. But when Jack complained to the Law Society, he got a very different response in a second letter. Surprise, surprise. Here was another letter from another solicitor of the firm with a cheque and a written apology to an extent for the shortfall money. Poke Island Hogan were adamant that Jack had not been double charged and were billing for other work done. Last December, the Law Society disagreed and found that the firm had overcharged. Jack saw it as an attempt to take part of what he'd earned through forced labour at the industrial schools. And for him to take that money from me, it looks to me like maybe I had done the last six months of that sentence to pay him. 60 years later. That is how I feel about it. He didn't have the right to do that to me.
You went down, your clothes were pulled down, you were put on the back of a chair in his the little office below, and you were beaten with his bloody strap. Boy, were you sore. Solicitor's taken 5,000 off us. For what? To give us 100,000. For what? And you'll tell me that. Can you answer that for me? No. They can't do that. Sean O'Neill is another abuse survivor from Passage West, County Cork. The Law Society found that he was overcharged by his solicitors, Ahern, Roberts, O'Rourke and Williams of Cargilline, from the compensation he got after spending 16 years in an industrial school. As a result, the solicitor was referred to the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal. Sean thought that that was the end of the matter. However, found to have overcharged him, the solicitor's firm then urged Sean to help them get the disciplinary charges against them dropped. Sean was asked to meet a senior partner of the firm. So I went down after work and uh, I was received in his office and uh, I was upset because I think he was genuinely upset. So I said, I said is there anything I can do? And uh, he said, well, he said, maybe you could write something. And uh, he says, more or less, I don't, not to be kind of leading you or anything like that, but if you put it into words like, like uh, you know, even though it was nice to receive the money back, that it really wasn't that important to me. Now, I couldn't accept that at all. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I'm a single parent with three children, and I think £3,000 is a lot of money to me. And I said, uh, there's no way. And from that moment on, I just felt I'm very, very uncomfortable there, you know. But the senior partner didn't give up. He wanted Sean to write a letter downplaying the seriousness of the overcharging. He wanted to use it in a high court case he was taking to stop disciplinary action being taken against the firm. Sean got numerous phone calls. I was afraid to pick up my mobile. I, I just really felt I didn't want to have one-to-one -one conversation about this with Mr. Which, uh, this, this is seen a partner and I thought that maybe if if I if it continued to you know that he would actually get the message but he didn't get the message instead the solicitor from Ahern Roberts O'Rourke and Williams wrote to Sean asking him to sign a letter he'd written on Sean's behalf it restated the sentiments Sean had refused to agree with at their meeting where he had stated that I had found that the money deducted were not excessive and the second thing that I was deeply disappointed and annoyed in which the way the Law Society uh, dealt with this. Um, I certainly couldn't say that I felt that way. You know, maybe the solicitor felt that way, but I certainly, I certainly couldn't sign that. The solicitor advised Sean to consult another solicitor before signing the letter to avoid any suggestion of duress, but Sean felt very uneasy. I shouldn't have got this letter. I really feel he shouldn't have taken the liberty of, of writing anything on my behalf and that if I did want to, if I did want to make a representation, that I certainly am quite capable. I just felt there wasn't an onus on me to do this. As a long-time client of the firm, Sean's loyalty to them could only stretch so far. I did say to him at one stage down there, you know, I said, Mr, I've, I've done a lot of business here, you know, and I've been here for years, and he said, and, and you will continue to do it. But I would say here that... No, that, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that I can't go down there again. The firm have told Primetime that there was a misunderstanding. They say that they regret the whole affair may have caused their client distress and apologise as it was never their intention. The Law Society says solicitors who overcharged in abuse cases are a small minority, but others say that the extent of overcharging is not reflected in the number of complaints. I would say it is the tip of the iceberg because we, I know that when this was, this was highlighted, solicitors got into their cars, went down, paid the cheques. A lot of the lads just didn't come forward. They got their cheques. Those particularly that knew there was wrong doing done and they got the cheques, that was the end of it as far as they were concerned. They weren't going to make a complaint. Others say that double charging is a more general problem and has been happening in personal injury cases after motor accidents for years. 
It was criticised in the Motor Insurance Advisory Board reports. This issue has been highlighted in our report since 2002 and was highlighted again in the 2004 final MIAB report, both of which were well in advance of the disclosures about the Residential Redress Board. In 2002, the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal were also alarmed about double charging and put a warning in the Professions magazine about it. The Law Society has also received 137 complaints in relation to overcharging of Army deafness claimants and a small number of soldiers are now re-examining their bills from a firm who admitted overcharging in redress board cases. Many personal injury and redress board claimants say they were billed by a percentage of the award, but billing by percentages has been banned outright since 1994. In a recent study carried out by UCD Economics Department on behalf of the government into solicitors' fees in personal injury claims, there was clear evidence that billing was not based on work done, but based primarily on the size of the award. What should have an impact on level of fees would be the amount of work put in by the lawyers, the number of expert witnesses called, the number of motions, the length of the trial, etc., etc. The award should have no impact on the fees in our statistical analysis, and it did. In fact, it was the only variable that had a significant impact. So overcharging and illegal billing appears to be a more general problem. Every year, over 1,000 people in Ireland feel so strongly about their solicitor's behaviour that they complain to the Law Society. It's a significant number, but the Law Society don't seem disturbed by it. We would estimate that with over 7,000 practising solicitors in Ireland every year, every one of those would have as a minimum probably well in excess of 100 live cases on their desk in the course of the year, many far more than that. That in total is three quarters of a million cases, transactions being dealt with by solicitors every year. We receive on average about 1,100 complaints. So far in the programme, we've seen examples of common complaints about solicitors, unnecessary delays, poor standards of work and overcharging. The question now is, if you choose to fight your solicitor on such issues, how does the system decide who wins? The vast majority of complaints are dealt with by the Law Society. Only a small number of serious complaints are sent on to the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal, or you can complain there direct. They impose sanctions and fines, but don't give compensation. There's also what's known as the Independent Adjudicator. She reviews the Law Society's handling of complaints, but she can't investigate them independently herself. The Minister for Justice has described this system as exemplary. The Law Society thinks so too. The entire system operates uh, with a number of independent uh, bodies with different powers. The Law Society is only one of them. Where the Law Society get it wrong, it can be put right elsewhere. It is a good system. It's a sound system. I believe the public should have confidence in it. They know the need change. Uh, and society knows the need change. And you know, the first steps have started. The latest report from the independent adjudicator described the Law Society's handling of complaints as fair and adequate, and another independent report described the procedures as logically structured, fair and open. But there are people who have used the system who strongly disagree. They make unlikely protesters. Recently at Athlone, people from all over Ireland gathered to call for reform of the complaint system. So how did this complaint system deal with the complaints that we have highlighted? The Law Society says it clamps down on solicitors who are found to be delaying. What we will typically do is set deadlines for the solicitor to achieve certain things, to monitor it very closely, to call them up again and again in front of the committee to require reports from them as to the progress made and ensure that they come up to the line. Theresa Toulon started writing to the Law Society three years ago about her solicitor's delay in administering a will. I knew the, the work wasn't done, so I wrote to the Law Society and they just sent the letter to him. And he wrote them a letter saying that he, oh, he was doing masses of work. And he wrote that letter and the Law Society are under the impression he has done a certain amount of work, which is not so. So they said at that stage that they wouldn't uh, interfere further. Last year they said they would not be referring the matter to the Complaints and Clients Relations Committee, who can take more serious action.
and we cannot, we cannot get justice. Where is the justice in all of this? Nobody seems to be able to help us. We've gone through the law society. They're not doing anything. They don't seem to be willing or able to be able to help us. The Tulans are still seeking the Law Society's help, nine years after their cousin's death. But the Law Society recently said that they could not adjudicate on delay until the case was finished. Annette Strachan only had success when she went to the disciplinary tribunal, where solicitor Joseph Griffin was found to have caused a seven-year delay. His penalty was to pay €5,000 into the solicitor's compensation fund. But Annette got nothing despite her financial loss of roughly €30,000. She went to the tribunal because she had grown weary writing to the Law Society for over two and a half years. They kept writing to him. He would eventually reply to them and, and say that he was doing it, don't worry. Um, they even came back to me and said, well, Mr Griffin said he's doing it, so we'll close the file. And I kept saying, well, no, he's not doing it. The deeds aren't registered. Um, so the Law Society didn't seem to have any influence to get anything done. The way in which we remedy it is to get the job done, get the delayed work completed in the interest of the, of the, of the client. We've looked at a number of cases of delay and what both uh, complainants have said to us is that they found that the Society did not apply sufficient pressure. Well, as you know, Una, I can't discuss any individual case. It is the approach of the Society it's not optional to us, it is what is designed in the statute, it is we seek to resolve the matter by applying pressure on the solicitor as appropriate to resolve the matter of delay. Delay is something we take seriously, it is something that reflects very badly on the solicitor concerned and in, in addition reflects badly on the profession as a whole. In Sean O'Neill's case, two members of his solicitor's firm are being disciplined for overcharging at the disciplinary tribunal. They've recently gone to the High Court to challenge the finding that they had overcharged. It'll be some time before Sean has an outcome. In Jack Dooley's case, the Law Society reprimanded solicitor Tim Kiley for overcharging. As with all complaints they uphold, the Law Society does not publish the solicitor's names. What happened to my solicitor Tim Kiley is an insult to me, personally. From what I believed was going to happen, it was a complete drawback by the Law Society. They should have been more severe, and let us see that they're being more severe. I have a letter in my possession. Just to give him a pat on the hand, that is my description of what happened to my solicitor. Six overcharging cases have been dealt with in this way. Since these overcharging solicitors' names are not published, you could be their client and not know about it. Like most complaints, Jack Dooley's was dealt with without his views being heard. If people really want to, um, to attend one of those meetings, we will let them do so. Their presence is not necessary. And anyone who feels that they are they're being disadvantaged in some way or they're dissatisfied, and very few people have ever expressed that, fact, have ever expressed that to fact. us. But if you have one case where, where somebody is, is dissatisfied, they can have the matter reviewed and examined again by an independent expert. Well, a lot of people just don't have the time and energy for that. That's why a lot of people so, wouldn't so be concerned uh, to, to attend uh, before, the meet, before this anyway. Why don't they but just give them the invitation? What's wrong with an invitation? Their presence is not necessary to the process. If they want to attend, they can. And if they're dissatisfied with the outcome, they can go elsewhere and have the matter addressed. Why do you think they're not necessary? Do you not think their opinion is equally important to it's the... It's not a question of their opinion. It's really is... The question is, what is the opinion of the committee, this group of people um, uh, who are quite experienced in looking into these matters, who have among their number independent people, non-lawyer people. Yes, the complaint is initiated by the individual. It is not necessary to the process to have them there. If they want to be there, they can be. But they won't know the date when it's happening. Well, if they ask to be there, they'll be told. From the most recent information available, there were 601 requests to solicitors to attend the complaints committee and only 28 complainants were present, or 4%. The Bullens didn't have sufficient confidence in the Law Society to take their complaint there. Uh, we, we were told that the they, they, Law Society is only there to protect solicitors. That we wouldn't get anywhere, basically. That we wouldn't get anywhere. 
Um, who told you that? It was after People who are also in our position, who have tried a law society and uh, got nowhere. Jackie and Bill Bullen are sceptical about the Law Society's dual role, representing solicitors and at the same time regulating them. Do you think it's fair that somebody who wants to make a complaint against a solicitor has to go to the representative body of that solicitor? They go to the regulatory body of that solicitor, not the representative body. That is who they go to. They go to the body that is established, has been given the powers by the Oireachtas to regulate the profession. It happened to be saying the body. Yes, but in fact, we have moved to even more clearly mark the separation between the representative and regulatory arms of the society. They are really quite separate. The real key issue is, does it work well in the public interest? No, I it does. About the Actually, it does work well what in the public interest. What about the principle? Interest. The principle is what works best in the public interest, and that is what works best what about in the public interest. the principle interest. of a conflict of interest? It isn't a conflict of interest because, as I've said to you, the representation and regulatory roles of the law society are quite separately and markedly separate. Uh, so there is no influence, uh, cross uh, influence from one to the other. Even within the legal profession, some key members say that the time has come to end self-regulation. From the point of view of consumer confidence, uh, the consumer nowadays, I think, will not accept self-regulation. And I'm against any profession, not alone the law society, but any profession regulating itself. I think the regula re regulatory body should be independent of the profession, but the profession should be entitled to have representation on it. To improve consumer confidence, the Law Society is introducing a lay majority on its Complaints Committee and the Government has published legislation setting up an Ombudsman's Office which will replace the independent adjudicator and supervise the Law Society. But does this go far enough? In Scotland they've gone a step further and fired the Scottish Law Society from its complaints handling role, replacing it with an independent commission of non-lawyers. Generally there was a feeling that it was wrong to have lawyers investigating complaints about lawyers. We concluded that the right thing to do was to set up a, a new independent commission that would have significant powers and the ability to deal decisively with complaints. We, we, we believe that it should give greater public confidence that complaints uh, against lawyers will be handled independently and objectively. As Scotland moves away from relying on an ombudsman to improve things, consumer advocates there say it's a missed opportunity for Ireland. It seems to me as if I think you're making a mistake at stopping short in new reforms, and a reform which seems to only deliver what we're moving away from in Scotland. I think you're losing an opportunity, I think the system's losing an opportunity, and your consumers will be left with a perception that lawyers are still looking after the interests of lawyers. One way or another, serious change is needed. The Irish government have backed proposals to reform legal costs but no one says it will reduce fees, but could increase them. It will, however, open up our currently closed system. Any system that's not transparent leaves itself wide open to abuse. That's obvious. So let's get rid of the, the opaqueness and then we'll all see what's happening. Then we can change whatever needs to be changed. But the first starts off with open up the system. Despite the evidence of lives seriously damaged by unresolved complaints against solicitors, the Law Society insists their system works. It doesn't surprise me, really, if we're talking about three quarters of a million cases a year, if we're talking about the number of cases being dealt with by solicitors over a number of years, because I think your cases go back over a number of years, we're talking about literally millions of potential cases that could come to the society. It doesn't surprise me that you will come up with a number of people who are dissatisfied. But the legal profession cannot afford to be complacent. A consumer revolt may already be underway. There is a cultural problem. Um, I basically believe that self-regulation just doesn't work. They're getting between nine and 16,000 per case. It's not enough to come along and want to take another little slice out of what we get. That is wrong. I'd said to her, you know, maybe we were fools, but, you know, we trusted them. What is the man doing or what does he, what does he have? The clients no rights at all. Some solicitors recognise the danger to the profession when the clients they are there to serve are increasingly frustrated and mistrustful. I think the public at, at large needs to be assured that the legal profession is there to serve clients 
we are there to serve clients and get the best possible results for clients and it is absolutely critical that clients have confidence in us and that they can trust us. And due to the bank holiday weekend, the final programme in this series of Primetime Investigates will be shown in two weeks' time on Monday, June the 12th.